broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for their attendance. Uh, I think we've got a really good topic today. Uh, today's topic is going to be about Oslo, our lens design program, and it's on a start-to-end optical design and engineering in Oslo. And basically, it's going to be an end-to-end -end example. Uh, our presenter for today is Dr. Richard Youngworth. Uh, Dr. Youngworth has his PhD from the Institute of Optics at the University of Rochester and has worked in the optics field for over 25 years. Uh, he works with Lambda Research Corporation's application engineering team, as well as our development teams, uh, in addition to running RIO LLC. He also teaches a, a successful SPIE short course on practical optical system design. Uh, that's course number SC003. Uh, he's a fellow of SPIE, a fellow of Optica, and is an adjunct associate professor of optical sciences at the University of Arizona. Uh, so again, so today's topic, it's going to be on Oslo, uh, start to end optical design and engineering in Oslo. And I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Youngworth. Uh, you're going to be in great hands. Uh, just uh, one quick note before I, we start. If anybody has any questions during the webinar, please feel free to type them into the questions box in your GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll address all questions at the end of the webinar. <coughs> Uh, we are also recording this webinar, and the recording will be available uh, in the next day or so on our website. So with that, uh, Dr. Youngworth, it's all yours. Thanks, Dave, so much. First, let me apologize. I have a little bit of laryngitis, so my voice is slightly scratchy, hopefully um, not too bad. So we have wanted to put together an example, a design example that shows a lot of how to use Oslo in one package. And my gut feeling was it was going to take two webinars to do this. And we're, I tried to fit it into one, but it ends up it is going to be two. So, um, but you can watch the second one, um, even if you can't make it on video later. So one of the goals of Lambda Research webinars, of course, is to be informative and, of course, interesting, even fun. So we'll hopefully try to get that done here. What does Oslo do? Well, let's just think about what some typical lens design or optical design tasks are. We have to manage system layout, lenses, mirrors, and geometry. We have to uh, pick our optical materials and we have to define light properties. Then often we want to modify the lens. So if we're going to optimize, we're gonna set variables. We also need to know what our performance targets are. Um, and in terms of optimization in Oslo, that's the error function. We certainly also want to optimize our system and do detailed modeling and performance assessment. And these processes can be iterative as we're doing them. And then ultimately, we need to clean the lens up so we can send it to a shop, and, you know, do our other engineering, our optomechanical engineering as well, and assign some tolerances to our system. So this is kind of the goals way of looking at how we're going to approach this. So we're gonna employ Oslo's capability for system layout and data entry. We're gonna construct um, and figure an error function here and a variable set, but we'll just show how to construct these things specifically with our example. We're gonna practice with local optimization. We're gonna analyze the results of our optimization. And then in the second session, uh, we'll prepare the lens for production by assigning and evaluating tolerances and cleaning the lens up, doing some of the things that we should be doing to these systems before we send them to the shop, put things on drawings. Okay, so we're going to show a complete example. It's going to be a projection lens, and we chose this because it doesn't have an obvious current application, but it is interesting. We'll have a patent for the starting point. And what we'll do is we'll intentionally set uh, ourselves to optimize as, as best we can within a short time frame. Uh, it's, it's actually hard to find a, a relatively interesting example that can be done in this short of a time frame with everything we're trying to do. Um, it'll have decent performance, but we're not saying that this would be what you would want to build for the application that, you know, the fictitious application we're talking about. 
So here's some basic specifications that we're going to work to for our projection lens. It's going to be telecentric at the source. It's going to have an NA of 0 0.05 at the source. We're going to have a distance uh, to the imager from the lens must be greater than 80 millimeters. That's just this idea that we need some space there. Uh, not a hard requirement, just a, not, not a requirement that's based on anything, just a requirement to show that we can put these kinds of targets in the system. We also want to have no prisms or cover glass necessary in it. And that's going to be important for our example because the starting patent that we're going to look at actually has prisms and cover glass in it. Our imager diagonal is going to be 35 millimeters. Our viewing screen diagonal is going to be 2.8 meters. The distance to the viewing screen needs to be between four and five meters. Our spectrum is going to be just the visible spectrum, but not blue shifted. It's going to be the D, F, and C lines. And I'll show more about what that means soon if you haven't seen it or need a, a refresher. And uh, we'll see how we do overall on image quality and color correction uh, with our starting point lens. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to use Oslo's capability for some uh, system layout and data entry. So there's a 1980 patent that we use as a basis. And here's uh, the PowerPoint slide for it. I'll show this really briefly. Here's the PDF. It's pretty easy to find these on Google Patent. So this is uh, 4189211. And this is actually a nice patent from what I can tell. Uh, whatever this was being designed to do, um, this lens is pretty quite well optimized that we'll find out. We, we do a very good job. Uh, I, I had very good luck finding its limitations in trying to design uh, our little system we're gonna do today. So you're gonna see that a little bit later. So this does pretty much what I expect it to do. So it's got a couple of, it's got a negative group in the front and then a positive group in the back with an aperture stop in the middle. And the other thing about it is it's telecentric. So let me rotate this just so you can see how it looks in the patent. And then we're going to take a look at it after we've entered it into Oslo. Whoops, I knew I'd do that. Which way is counterclockwise? It's too early in the morning. All right, <clears throat> so you can see here, this is a ray trace going through the lens, and you can see all of the cones of light hit perpendicular here to the, um, this is actually the source. So this lens is designed backwards from maybe how a lot of you would think about it. The light is actually traveling out from the source, whatever that ends up being, um, some sort of device that can be imaged and goes to the left. However, in Oslo, we're designing it from left to right. And many people might say, why would you set it up this way? Uh, you certainly can set it up the other way around, but the traditional way to design lenses was to design from the farther conjugate to the shorter conjugate. So the screen is farther away than the little imager we have here. So that's probably enough of looking at the base pattern because we really want to get into Oslo. So in Oslo, uh, what we have here is um, a number, a bunch of numbers that I've entered into the surface data spreadsheet. And we've also entered in some estimated values for entrance beam radius, object height, and uh, we've also put our wavelengths in. So we put in some things that define the light. So more specifically, uh, the key areas in the surface data spreadsheet are the column entries that we have to make here, the material entries we have to make here, and then uh, there's the sub-spreadsheet of the general, the setup, and the wavelength. So let's just look at a few things that were used to set this up without going through the tedium of typing it in. So I've got Oslo open. I've got four tiled windows here that are showing this base lens that we've got. So from the patent itself, if we go look at the patent, again, which of course it's, I've got it rotated so I can screw up rotating it again here. Oh, good. Did it right that time. So if we look here, you know, we've got a table of data and I've literally just taken the data out of this table and put it in Oslo. There are, of course can be cases where 
we um, might have something that we've already done or something else in Oslo, or you might even be starting from a more basic from scratch approach. So uh, you can see it's uh, 106 uh, point um, six seven is what I've got here. It turns out, of course, the first number I look at, somehow there's a typo. It's 106.07, but that ended up not affecting us very much in this. The lens is still operating quite well. Um, you can see we've got a cemented doublet here. So if we look at this and compare our pictures, uh, they compare pretty well. So that's the radii, the thickness, uh, the aperture radii, I just typed in from the table too, and then the glasses. So nothing too interesting yet. So let's talk a little bit about these other three spreadsheets that I mentioned. So one, if I click on the general, we are only tracing the central reference ray exactly. The rays that are going towards the edges of the stop actually are traced pretty closely without doing a fancier ray tracing, like a wide angle ray tracing mode. So uh, we can approximate where those are and it fills the stop quite well. So I didn't bother with any fancier ray tracing here. And you can see this if we look at our lens. These are pretty close to where they would actually be. If you wanted it to be perfectly accurate, you'd want to change the ray aiming to wide angle mode, which makes it more exact, for example. Or you could use rim reference rays. The other thing that I changed in here was, <clears throat> um, well, actually, I didn't change it in here. There's actually another, another thing I did because I like to do it that I don't have in the slides, but I'll show it here under lens drawing conditions. I often like to draw the aperture stop. So I turned that on. I also made it where we had three rays coming from three different field points. We include our 0.7 field point. So that's how we get these pictures. Uh, this here is just the 0 0.7 field and 1.0 field, the fractional field coordinates. And we have some similar uh, things over here for our MTF. The setup button is one where what we've done is we've entered in the entrance beam radius. I maybe didn't even use this. If it's set on entrance beam radius, you can just type the number in. And we set a particular object height. This was based on me estimating what the field of view was. I didn't read the patent um, so detailed so closely that, um, uh, that I got every single spec the way that they had it because I knew we were going to use it for our own different specifications. So that's kind of the setup. Uh, you can set your aperture, your field, and then the conjugates. So once you enter in one of these numbers, it becomes the driver for your uh, light going into the system. And the other thing, of course, is the wavelength. Now, the patent, the wavelengths are actually set to be 0 0.56, 0 0.51, 0 0.61, 0 0.46, 0 0.66. And you can see what the weights, this is very heavily weighted to the center of the spectrum lighter on the blue uh, shifted a little bit more of the red so this is uh was some type of device that was being used that would send out this type of spectrum i haven't defined a device we're going to use in our case we've just made it where we're going to operate assuming d f and c wavelengths and only using three although often a designer might use five so that's essentially how we get this design into oslo how we get going and these are things that we've had other webinars, and we've shown a lot of things like this in the past. And of course, I didn't hit the right button. There we go. Okay. So here's how the patent design looks after we type it in. Uh, here we have, um, uh, if we take a look at the ray intercept curve window and the MTF window uh, in Oslo right now, it should look somewhat like this. And you can see that's the MTF window and the ray intercept curves. And they're pretty, pretty close. Uh, one of the things about doing this kind of exercise that Dave can uh, also confirm is uh, you can get into this real screwy um, situation where somehow when you're trying to do something live, it doesn't completely match what you did before. Don't worry too much about that. We're just looking at the principles of how this works. Um, I've been doing this quite a long time. And normally, I find it takes quite a bit longer for me to set something up to show it like this than if I just kind of going through doing things on my own. So the next thing we need to do is we need to set up the lens for our specifications. So you know, the lens is backwards, as I mentioned. 
So the changes we need to make, and I'll, I'll say these verbally, and we'll actually do all of these just to show them to you. So we need to make the image NA of 0.5. We need to uh, make the distance to the imager from the lens. We need to make sure it's greater than 80 millimeters. But we also don't have all that glass that's in the back of this lens. If we take a look back at our picture here, there's all this glass back here, it's silica actually, that is, um, uh, that's essentially fused silica. Uh, it's essentially um, not going to be in our next design or our design. The image are diagnosed 35 millimeters. The viewing screen diagnosed 2.8 meters. Now, if we know, uh, we can actually use the magnification because we have a 35 millimeter di uh, corner diagonal imager and a 2800 millimeter uh, diameter screen. We can actually use a transverse or lateral magnification here, which is what we'll do. Then we change the spectrum, and then you can choose to change the name of the lens, which I did here. I went from base to what our specs were. But it's the only time I'm changing the, the name of the lens. So if we go back to our lens here, so here we are starting up. Uh, we need to set the image NA to 0.05. So I come in here and I go image NA 0 0.05. Right now it's using the entrance beam radius, um, which is kind of, it's not a, an infinite conjugate system. I prefer to work in NA if I have a finite conjugate system. So this is gonna set the NA of our cones at the sensor to 0.05. Not the sensor, I apologize. The image of what we're sending light out of into our system here. So the next thing we have is we need to get rid of all this extra glass in here. And when we do this, I can go in here and I can just delete all of the surfaces that have the glass, but there's an important thing we wanna do in addition. And the important thing we wanna do in addition to that is we wanna put a solve on this last surface. So we set an axial rate height uh, to zero. I'm gonna go ahead and just update this window. And it didn't quite draw it the way I want. I actually really wanna see my imager in this lens. And to control that, what you can do is come in here and you can, uh, let me just say where here it is. Oops, I definitely don't wanna do that. Hit our green check mark, which accepts our results. Open my surface data spreadsheet. If I come here to the special window, there's this surface control and general. So on the very last surface, I can change this and force Oslo to draw that surface. Often it will only draw things if you force them to. The default is it'll draw a mirror, but it, it'll draw something that the index of refraction is changing between the two. So here I would just have literally an aerial image in a sense, or an aerial location. There's no change in index that I have there. So it doesn't draw it by default, so I'm forcing it to draw that. And that, by the way, was in our instructions here under draw. Okay, next up is we want to set our imager diagonal to 0 0.3, uh, sorry, 3, 35 millimeters, our units of our lens. If we were to go under general, you see it's min millimeters. So now we go again to setup, and here we want to use the Gaussian image height. Now, if I enter 35 in here, it's wrong. That's because 35 is the diagonal corner to corner. The Gaussian image height we're defining here is going to be half of that. Be very careful about factors of two. The nice thing about Oslo is we can use the command line or entry line here as a calculator. So I can just say 35 divided by two if I'm being really lazy. And it calculates 17.5. That's one, of course, that's easy to do in your head. But if you have one that isn't, you can use the command line as a calculator. So the next thing we want to do is uh, set the viewing screen diagonal to uh, 2.8 meters. Now we could, we, we can't really type in the object height to do that, but I know to get that, I have this imager uh, diagonal is going to be 35 millimeters. And if I want a 2.8, the magnification I need to do that, remember this is demagnifying because we're going the opposite way here. We're going the from the screen to the, to the imager that we have. So what we want to do is we want to actually uh, take and do minus because the system is going to invert the image. So in the electronics, you of course want to write the image upside down on the imager. Oops. 
and we put in um, minus 35 divided by 2800. And if we do that, we get minus 0 0.0125. And if you look here, now the object height is 1400 millimeters. Well, 1400 is half of 2.8. So that is what we expect. So now we move to the next thing, which is to do the wavelengths. So right now I have five wavelengths to find. We're going to drop it down to three and we're going to use D, F, and C. I promised earlier I would show what I meant by that. If you click here on the wavelength, Oslo has some spectral lines to find for us. So we can use this helium 587.56. We can use the F line. Notice I'm doing mid, low, and high. If you don't do it that way, it won't calculate the Abbey number correctly. And there are certain other things that depend on that as well. So it's always good practice to do middle, low, and high. And then you would alternate go low, high, low, high for additional wavelengths. But you want to use the first three that you're defining your, um, your Abbey number with. So here I got 486.1, as I, I think I already done that one, yes. And then here we have 656.3. Of course, I'm speaking in nanometers and also has them here in, um, in, in micrometers. So there's 486.1. So now this is, uh, whoops, 656.3, sorry. So that's D, F, and C. So that's it, that should actually uh, work for us. We can actually update all the windows. You can click on each window individually, um, but there's actually a quick little command you can use called UDA, update all. So that updated all the windows at once. If you wanna look that up in help, you can type help here. And here I type in UDA and that's update all, or you can use update underscore all. Nice little trick that I thought I would show at this point. And also, I typed in and changed the lens name here. Okay, so that's uh, where we are setting the lens for our specifications. If we go back to our presentation. Here's the lens now in Oslo. Uh, here's the performance curves. Uh, you can see this lens has um, quite a bit of lateral color, and it has quite a bit of astigmatism when we change the specs around. So this is completely expected. It really was was. Uh, didn't have nearly the the band uh, the spectral band that we're using here, and so we basically pushed it as hard as we can. Plus, it's telecentric. Okay, now more important things. Let's get to constructing error functions in the variable sets. So, <clears throat> for variables, uh, we're going to make all the classes models, then we're going to create RN and DN variables for each of them. Then we're going to vary all the curvature thicknesses and air spaces. There's a couple things that we'll have to, to fix after this as well. So let's, let's go ahead and, and do this. I'm not going to do it from this lens uh, in case I screwed something up in showing it to you. Uh, we're going to go to our prepared lens for this. So the first thing we're going to do is the variables. So with the variables, notice all these glasses are actually real glasses. I can't vary those. First thing you have to do if you want to optimize and vary is turn them into models. So we turn them into models. We just hit OK a bunch of times here. And I'm not going to do every one of them. So that's what you do to get that. And then to turn those variables on, what you actually do is, um, so we'll just do surface one. So for surface one, so this is the variable spreadsheet editor, I should say that. You can find it here on the surface data spreadsheet. You can also find it under optimize variables. You can get it there too. And uh, you can also open it up from the spreadsheet. There's a lot of ways to get to this. So you can do right click and do insert before or after. You can use these little buttons up here. And for surface one, I want to actually vary RN and DM. I don't have time to explain exactly what these are. RN uh, is related to the refractive index. In many cases, it is what it is. Um, but DN actually rotates you off the glass line. So this is best, this is documented well in our optics reference. So these are two variables mapping out the uh, dispersion and the refractive index. So uh, that's why that works just great. So I would do that for every single one of these glasses. I would create the glass, the model glass, and then I would enter these in. 
Then the next thing we do is we vary all curvatures, vary all thicknesses, vary all air spaces. So in what I show in the presentation, I've actually made all the glasses, but I don't want to take the time to do it here. Uh, but there's a small problem. If we tried to optimize this, if you notice, we've got this second lens cradled within this first lens. So, you know, I don't really like that very much. I, I think I'd prefer to keep that uh, as a, um, as a uh, cemented surface. So right here, what I, what I say is let's uh, keep them cemented, but put a pickup on curvature three um, using a, the source surface for that two. I'll show you that in a minute with the default zero constant one multiplier. And then I actually did something wrong and I, and I did it wrong and I decided to keep it. So um, what I did is I took this, I make this uh, a curvature pickup and I base it on surface two, zero and one. So this means that this will actually tie this radius of curvature to this, uh, preceding radius of curvature. Now, what we should do is get rid of the thickness as a variable, but I foolishly, when I first did this, did it with the curvature, and that's actually gonna be wrong. So I'll show what that does in just a moment. The next thing you wanna do is make sure that you do still have a solve on your second to last surface for the proxy image, and make sure you have the variables. Notice my object uh, space is not a variable. You could do that in this case if you really wanted to or needed to, but I didn't do it. I'm going to live with these conjugates with the magnification we've defined. Uh, one thing that's important to note about Oslo that not all codes do this nowadays, but this last surface, it does actually propagate that distance before it evaluates the different parameter, the different imagery uh, specifications. And it's pretty easy to test that. If I defocus this, let's say by three millimeters, it's gonna make this go completely to garbage. So you can see we're using that last surface. It's important to point that out, especially if you're coming, if you've used another code that doesn't do that. So this is actually an advantage. It's really nice to do that because a hardcore old school thing to do is determine uh, a rough focus or a praxial focus, or even you can make this a flange focus or anything you'd like. And then you can figure out an offset of this lens with respect to that, uh, that choice. So here's basically pictures of how our lens should look. Afterwards, notice I have this error for the curvature in here. Here's the variable spreadsheet if you set up all of them. Uh, you notice you have the RN and DNs for all of the different surfaces of the glasses, the curvatures, the thicknesses. If you add in new variables, uh, it, they'll put them at the end of the list. So I like to keep myself a relatively tidy list a lot of the time when I'm showing things at least. So I tend to reorder them. You, know, you can get into any of these spreadsheets, and this is really handy to do. You can go in here and you can just select some, you can copy them or cut them, and then you can go and paste them somewhere else. So I can cut these from this location and I can paste them above that line down here very easily. What's nice is you can go into a different Oslo file, copy something out of it, open your uh, a different uh, the other file you want to work in and paste in from there the, the copy function does work between files or you can open it up and do it with um in, in a text editor if you know how Oslo is set up with commands so okay so that's our variable spreadsheet um and that's our variables so i'm going to move on now here inside oslo And just to make sure we don't have a problem, I'm going to go ahead and close these. Now we're going to go to our error function. Uh, now the error function, uh, there's a punchline here. First for the error function, we're just going to, we would just run this generate error function. Also spot size wave front. I'll show you on the next slide which of these buttons we change and just explain what they are. And then I'll show you that you can have a command uh, at the end of it. And we're not going to append to the existing error function. So if I come back here, this is what we do. We generate the error function. Let me show you again, just so everybody's sure where this is. So we go to optimize, generate error function, and we're using this uh, automatic error function generator that's here. That's what this window is. So what we're changing from the default is we're going with nine samples for the field. That's because I really want to make sure I'm sampling out in the field a lot because I'm expecting uh, lateral color problems 
which goes out in the field and I'm expecting some problems with some higher order astigmatism. So I wanna make sure I'm sampling enough out there. We use RMS wave for an error. We use the Conrad D minus D. Uh, this is a way to do color correction based on just a couple arrays documented in our optics reference as well. We wanna correct the distortion or at least maintain the distortion, not allow it to go over 4%. So we do that. So if we go ahead and do that step in it, hopefully I do this right, but it's not that big of a deal. We did nine, we did nine, we did uh, CHR DMD, RMS wavefront error, we corrected distortion and made it 4%. And I think that's all we did. Sorry, I'll live with it. So now we come in and uh, I just typed in OSC. This is one of these commands that I tend to type it in but it's here under operands. So this is the actual error function at the moment. Now, this is a problem that we haven't actually added in some things that you really need for our specifications. There's nothing in here that keeps things telecentric, that keeps this image space telecentric. There's no target or constraint in here for the image height or the transverse magnification. Uh, we don't have something that checks to make sure that our back focal length is staying big enough in optimization as well. And we don't have anything in here right now that uh, if we are changing TH0, the first thickness, that's making sure it's within spec. I add that in, in our case here, even though we aren't actually varying that. It's just in case I need it later. And I can't remember if I need it or not off the top of my head, but it's in there. So that's not a bad thing to do. So if we come back here, here's what we want to type in to do this. So I put weights on the telecentricity and back focal length requirements. I have these as constraints, image height and transverse magnification. When we optimize with damp least squares, it will use Lagrange multipliers to solve for constraints. It will optimize with damp least squares for everything else. And notice some of them are just checks. So when it violates the check, it starts penalizing. Uh, and some of them are differences. So when uh, our Chief, our paraxial chief ray is not at 17.5 millimeters, it will penalize us for it. And then these are squared and summed. So sum of squares type of process, RMS sum of squares. So when we enter all this in, just to show you how it looks in nozzle. Oh, and let me show you how to actually do these entries too. This is, this is important enough. Um, so one thing is, we go here to evaluate, sorry, optimize operands. We come here, I can right click, I can insert before. And um, if I don't put an underscore in front of something, you will actually see it. Let's do our uh, this BFL, let's do the image height constraint. So the image height constraint that we put in was uh, PYC minus 17.5. Uh, so there, that's that, that's that in here and to change it to a constraint, I click on this button. If I wanna have it as a minimize, I give it a weight and I keep it like that. So we can do this for all of these uh, different parameters. We have the negative positive telecentricity constraints, back focal length, image height, transverse magnification thicknesses. Let's say I don't remember what, the, what one of these parameters happens to be. What's a fast way I can find that? And I find a lot of users uh, because it's not in a wizard where we use it in the generate error function, um, they get a little bit frustrated because they're not aware how easy it is to go into just the operands and type this in. And finding things is also pretty straightforward. You click on this button now. Right now, I had it selected on the PYC command, but if I keep it general here and I hit this question mark, it's going to go to generating an error function. So usually, where I go is here under operands and components. And there's a whole set of choices for these. So for example, for the system, uh, the object height one, uh, oh, here, transverse magnification. Transverse magnification is right here, first surface, last surface, and if there's a configuration. And if we look at back here at what we ended up, what we did, we did transverse magnification. Now, when it doesn't have numbers, it goes to the default. So the default for transverse magnification is from the object to the image. Uh, so what I might have done is typed in zero, and I think it's 14 surfaces here, and it just automatically, oh, actually, let's just do it. Let's do it. Why am I doing it this way? Let's just show it. It's not hard to show. So transverse magnification. And here I would do Tmag. 
zero comma, I thought there were 14, hopefully I'm right, plus uh, 0 0.0125. Remember, it was minus 0 0.0125 as our target. So T mag 0, 014 in that. It happened to keep them here, but if I didn't have those in here and I just typed in T mag, it would automatically know to go from the object surface to the image surface. Sometimes when you type something in and it's a default, it actually deletes it out. Uh, we can evaluate our error function at any point by clicking here on operands as well. So you can see both of these are satisfied right now. Right now they're weighted constraints. Both of the ones that I typed in are actually ones that are constraints. So let me change them to constraint mode just so you can see that. So you see this isn't uh, this isn't hard to do. This is one of the big po points of this entire webinar is to show you can set up your error function and then you can put in your own custom things. Now you might, uh, and here, let me show you how this looks, OPE down this window, and you can see uh, this is what they look like here. Uh, now, another thing that is uh, good to know is let's say later I want to regenerate my error function somehow, but I don't want to have to copy these, I don't want to have to copy these lines out of some other spreadsheet. Is there some way I can do that? And the answer is yes. If you go to uh, optimize and we come here to generate error function, there are choices to append existing error functions. The one thing I'll warn you about is often Oslo, when you do that, doesn't clean out all of the old field points and ray set. So every now and then you might want to go in and clean those out because this generates field points and ray sets. So you see now we're getting quite a few. So here's the field points. There's a lot of field points. Unless you're using it for something, it might not be worth keeping it in the field point set. And then we have the same thing here under optimize. So that's FSE if you want the command and it's error function tables ray set. So this is points in the pupil that are being considered for rays that we're tracing for the optimization and the others are the field points. Okay, said quite a bit there. Now, wanted to show something else. So remember I told you, told us that we screwed something up here. And uh, I found this when I hit the um, evaluated the error function. Like, There's a boundary violation. There shouldn't be boundary violations. What a boundary violation is, is here, if I have a variable set to something and I'm outside of these bounds, what Oslo does is it penalizes. Now, the way it penalizes is it calculates all of this and then it adds the boundary violation, but doesn't show you the numbers here. So these numbers here are slightly different than if I actually did the math of weighting these and adding them up, weighting, squaring, and adding them up. So there shouldn't be a boundary violation. The reason why there's a boundary violation is because for that airspace, it says to go between 0.5 and 100, but that airspace is set to zero right now. So I found that I had screwed something up. So the message is, make sure you understand boundary violations. This is telling me something. So make sure that it makes sense that you understand what that variable is and why you have a boundary violation. So in order to fix this, and I'll just show this here, what you do is you delete the curvature two variable and uh, it should be delete the, the thickness two variable. To change this is actually pretty trivial. You could just come in here into the variables and here where it had a curvature of two, which oh, right here it had th of two. Uh, and it was set to zero. If I change that to curvature, and then I can cut this out, and I can place it up here where I like to have it, and I'm done. Now when I evaluate my error function, you see it went away, that particular problem. And that's what this slide shows. Okay, got to keep moving. So that's how we set up uh, an error function. That's how we can customize it. That's how we set up our variable sets and a lot of details about the variable set. Let's now practice with local optimization, and then we'll start up on, on analyzing. So coming back to here, what I tried to do um, from past experience, when you do something really complicated and it has to be right, it's good to actually get the uh, system set up. Now notice these numbers are all still nice rounded numbers. So this is before optimization. I'm going to update all my windows here, and you're going to see this. I'm also going to use a right click and clear this window so that it's a nice clean thing we're looking at. So here, uh, this is the value point 
046. You can see the values of our different targets that we've entered in here and our different constraints. Essentially, these targets, I call them constraints, but really there's constrained ones and then there's ones that you're uh, waiting. W-E-I-G-H-T-I-N-G. So let's go ahead and optimize now. So to optimize, you can type in I-T-E, you can go here to optimize iterate, and this is going to be using damply squares. There are other optimizers in here that we have, including some global ones. They are under advanced optimization, but the workhorse is damply squares in Oslo. So what I uh, do here is here on the top window, I like to keep open the optimization tools nowadays. For many years, I didn't even do that, but I actually kind of like it now. You can actually edit your optimization operands from here. Uh, you can actually even generate an error function from here, which would open back up both options for that. Uh, but what we're going to do here in this case is we're just going to optimize 50 iterations. And you can see the error functions dropping. I'm not sure if it's completely bottomed out yet. Oh, look, now it bottomed out a little better. I'm going to go ahead and call that good. And now I'm going to update these one at a time. All right, so you can see telecentricity has changed a little bit. The lens has changed around. We don't actually show these curves, but you can see if we do the through frequency curves at 25 cycles per millimeter line up beautifully. Uh, check out what happens here. What happens here is it was 0.05 before, now it's 0.02. This is almost completely secondary lateral color driving that part of it. There's a little bit of field curvature in here as well. You can see the astigmatism curves here. Show that the distortion is still under control, and here's our lateral color. And you can see sort of a, a picture of it. Now, um, if I click on the MTF curves here, you can see that we have actually improved them. Uh, just a, a trick here, one thing I've done is I have forced this window to only draw three of these. The default, let me open another window to show you this. Let me open a graphics window five. The default would be to draw all your field point, a bunch of the field points that you've got to find. But I mean, it just gets to be a wall of, of data then. So I'm only doing three in this case. But for the MTF curves, I'm drawing all of them. However, on the MTF curves, uh, I'm forcing it to only draw up to 60 because that's how I'm comparing. So this has improved. It's definitely improved. So here's kind of our starting point. Here's where we end up after our optimization. Um, it's not as telecentric if we wanted to fix that. We could target that with constraints. Uh, we could also um, go in and uh, add extra, uh, we can constrain it, we can increase the weights, we can add more targets in. Um, just so you see it, um, I'm not going to, I'm going to show you where I, I got these, but I'm not, I'm just going to show you the results here. This is still pretty close to the target value, and I allowed it to go to, you know, uh, five degrees. So uh, this is actually a direction cosine, but it basically was allowing it to go to five degrees. We do the praxial trace. Uh, that's the direction cosine 0.05. But here, if we look, um, the actual ray trace due to some distortion is only two and a half degrees. So I'm going to say we're going to live with it. The way I got that data out, in case you're interested, is we come here and we run for the operands, of course, we've been running a lot operands. The paraxial trace data that I've got here is under evaluate, and we can do a paraxial ray analysis and a paraxial ray trace. And then I only uh, did range 14 to 14. also has got wonderful um, range 14 to 14, so we're only showing that last surface. And then the other thing that I that we do is we run one of these single ray traces. Also, is really great because you can you can specify what ranges of surfaces for your output you want to show. It's really wonderfully flexible with its commands. So here I ran. I think I ran full, and I ran only fourteen to fourteen. We traced through the middle, but I also made sure to change to the field full field of view because we want to look at the field point. Oslo operates with a current field point concept. So right now, the current field point is the axial. So I would need to change it to one to go to the full field of view. And then if I run this, you know, you can see what we ended up with uh, from that. <clears throat> so it's 2.48994. It's not quite the same. So I don't have exactly the same lens in here uh, as what I had in the, in the presentation, but you get the idea. Okay, we could say, are we done? And in many design problems, um, you need to expect to manipulate the error function 
the constraints and target aberrations, try different starting points, maybe you do some global optimization. But we really kind of pushed this thing quite, quite hard. This lens uh, and patent was good. It did exactly what it promised. When I started this, I almost guessed up front if this was a good patent that I'm not really modifying very much, that what we would end up with is something that has uh, some lateral color, uh, which it does, a secondary lateral color. And then um, it's limited by a little bit of higher order astigmatism as well. So it's kind of doing what I would expect. But if you want to make it better, you would have to start doing some more things to change it. Altering glasses, you might change the configuration, et cetera. Um, and changing the glasses is probably good. These are pretty ugly glasses that are in this thing right now. Um, they're um, usually before you build anything, of course, you want to look at that. Uh, the first doublet, you know, I, I'd want to make sure that that, how, how that would be made. Uh, there's a very tight air lens in here, you can see. So I found that when I tried to get rid of that, it wanted to make this last lens really thick to correct the field curvature, and it didn't really work that well. So I'd have to do something else to fix that. Um, air spaces too, you know, there's a lot of close air spaces or they what you want for thermal and other possible problems. So are we done? Well, there's three extra tasks required. Um, well, one is that we have model glasses. Shops don't use model glasses. So you need to fix the glasses or select glasses that do that. Um, shops also don't like it when you have a gazillion digits that you're showing. Um, and then, you know, we didn't really resize the diameters of the parts at all when we did this. So kind of where we are, yeah, it's probably easier if I go show it in here. Where we are, if you look, we're not illuminating. There's a lot of wasted glass in here. So, you know, you might want to thin these up too, but there's, there's just some things that we obviously have to do. We, we need to worry about our diameters of our lenses. We've got to make the glasses real, and we also have to round our numbers off because uh, shops do not like it if you throw out numbers that are, oh my goodness, how far back I have to go. Actually, I think maybe I'm showing it later. Do, do, do. Yes, here we go. Um, you know, they don't like all these extra digits in this. So that this isn't a particularly good thing to do. Uh, so we're going to be fixing glasses, rounding numbers, modifying diameters. Um, and I had kind of planned to get through the fixing of the glasses today if I could. So we're kind of prepared to do that. Um, but I'm actually going to, I'm not sure if it's going to turn out to be exactly like this uh, when we finish. But I think we'll go ahead and do that next time. But I'll show you at least how to do this. So, you know, to round off numbers, you just go in and round them off. And I'll show a few extra things of how to do this next time. To set the apertures, you can actually do a quick solve and round the number off from there. Or you can just eyeball it, or you can use beam footprints. So we'll show a little bit about that in our second session. And to fix the glasses, what you do is you go in here to fix, and you pick a catalog, you fix it. And then what you'll want to do is you want to go in and re-optimize. And I'm doing them all in our example in one shot next time. So I'm just changing them all and then optimizing once. But sometimes you might want to change a glass and then re-optimize, do a glass, re-optimize. And you might want to pick, pick them by hand. If you have favorite glasses, you might want to have your own private catalog if you'd like to do that. There's a lot of ways to make Oswald work for you to do this. So that's kind of where we'll, uh, where we'll start on that next time. Um, And I'll just show you where we're going to end up when we're kind of done fixing. This might not be how the exact numbers uh, look. We will end up with a set of glasses that are fixed, and then we'll do some re-optimization. So uh, that's a good point for us to stop today so that we have some time uh, for some, some questions. So thank you. Dave is maybe going to help me here with the question. Okay, yep. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So, uh, great webinar, Richie. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to remind everybody that if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to, to just type them into the questions box here in the GoToWebinar uh, control panel. Uh, we do have a couple questions here. Uh, one is, why did you use the RMS wavefront rather than the spot size in this case? 
So I'll tell you my rule of thumb. <clears throat> so first of all, try them, right? Doesn't hurt to try. Usually what I do is I use RMS Wavefront when I have a system that's corrected better. So this one I was fairly certain was gonna have some decent MTS, it doesn't have, I'm not looking at, I, I do have this lateral color problem certainly, but uh, these are pretty good. I mean, this is 20, 20 micrometers. The spot size is if we were to look at them, this maybe isn't the best way to do it. It's, of course it's not. And it's really slow for whatever reason. Uh, if I look at, for example, um, spot sizes, showing you a bunch of tricks you can invert the background to. Oh, I didn't want to do it that way. So if we look at this, you can see all that lateral color. On this, you know, I can start looking at things like the airy disk. I'm just showing people this who haven't seen that. You can see these spot sizes are actually pretty small compared to the airy disk, even though I've got that lateral color issue. And by the way, lateral color is terrible. You might want to fix this lateral color in a projector, especially. I'm not saying that this is a solution to this particular problem, but it just happens to be what limits it. Uh, if I had the spot sizes a lot bigger than uh, then, you know, my airy disk or, you know, my MTFs were just absolutely horrible. If I was very geometrically limited, I would definitely be using spot size. So that's my rule of thumb. Is there a hard rule? Like, where do you switch off? No, there isn't. And there's even other derived metrics you could do, build your own error functions on things like encircled energy. So that's the general gist of it. The more diffraction limited, use wavefront. Okay, great. Uh, another question, can you explain a little bit more on how the setup spreadsheet is organized? Yeah, I, I kind of glossed over that a little bit. So with the with the setup spreadsheet, if we look here, there's a column for aperture, a column for field, and a column for conjugates. Once you enter one of these in, it will become the choice that you have out here to a point. So here, uh, right now, I've got this specified with 0.05 and, um, image NA. But let's say I go to setup here, and instead I want to use the object NA. This has got a high magnification. So let's say I change it to that, and I go back now. You'll see that's now my choice. So that's one way to switch that. It won't always work for everything, because it depends if you have infinite, infinite conjugates, conjugates or not. I could also do like a field angle for this, for example. But I can't use uh, an object type for an infinite conjugate system. It doesn't mean anything. You need to use an angle in that case. So there's ones for aperture, ones for field, and then there's ones just defining the conjugates, where is the object and image relative to each other. And if you want to know more on this, of course, you can always look at it here under the help. Okay. Great. Um, I know when you mentioned when you were doing wavelengths, you talked about setting it middle, low, high. Um, what's the reasoning for that? Yeah, this was another thing. When we when we do our, our wavelengths, um, I think right here, I'm still using mono glasses, but let's go ahead and let's live with it. So here if I do refractive index, um, uh, this uh, PSK53A that I've actually already changed one of apparently, uh, this actually has a an ABA number of 63.38. But that's based on using the middle wavelength, the, the D here, and then the F and the C in that order. If you don't do it in that order, you won't get the right acne number. I believe also it will screw up things like Conradi D minus D and a few other things in the program. With that said, you could set up some things if you don't care about that stuff as brute force, do it in whatever order you want. But also makes an assumption about what the correct order is. Okay. Um... And then oh, another question here. Uh, I'll address that one actually in a second. Uh, you mentioned or you showed damp leaf squares for the optimization. Does Oslo have other optimizers, including global optimization capability? Yeah, I, I glossed over that too. First of all, I should tell everyone the plan now is, especially when my voice actually recovers, is to do uh, some more training videos because we're a little bit light on some areas, one of which is optimization and another is tolerancing. So the idea of this couple of webinars was to cover an end-to-end -end example to show some of those, but also to show some much more detailed information. We do have a little bit on optimization. By the way, the, these are on our support site. The idea uh, 
with optimization in OSL, there's a lot of choices. There's a simplex and PALS method. Really, those aren't as commonly used local optimizers. Really, the one that's commonly used is the damp blue squares, which is why it isn't under advanced optimization. For global, we have adapted simulated annealing, and then there's a search method called Global Explorer. So there's multiple optimizers in here, and you could always run Global Explorer or something else to see if you get much progress for adaptive simulated annealing. One thing to note about all of those methods, though, Global Explorer depends on starting point, adaptive simulated annealing. You have to be careful about how large of a space you define so that it initializes right and actually converges eventually. So I think that covers um, you know, the, the general gist of it. So uh, the other thing, by the way, though, is um, also it's not a, a smart program in the sense that it's not going to add in lenses for you and do things like that. There's a lot that the user has to guide it to do because lens design is very numerically complex. So that's uh, why people are still designing lenses, even though this has been done for a long time and done with computer-aided methods for a long time. Great. Um, last question I have here in the questions box right now is that somebody's asking if they can have a recording of this webinar. Uh, yes, we are recording this webinar and we will be putting a copy of it on our website. It'll be under the Oslo support section and I expect that'll be up within the next day or so. Yeah, there's three folders for our videos. There's beginning kind of beginning intermediate and advanced this one will live under the the beginning because um if somebody hasn't been using oslo much you should be able to watch this and learn something and get going in it yeah so again once once we get that recording ready we will be putting it up like i said i would expect uh by the end of this week we'll have that available wow. it'll memorialize my uh, laryngitis <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so with that, I don't have any more questions, so I will just uh, throw it open one last time for questions. Uh, while I'm waiting there, I just, again, like to thank Dr. Youngworth for his presentation today. I'd also like to thank everybody in the audience for their attention and for, for uh, coming today. Uh, we will be sending out, as Dr. Youngworth mentioned, we're, we're splitting this webinar into two parts. We don't have the exact date for part two, but it's going to be within the next week or two. So as soon as we have that available, we will send that out uh, to basically to everybody that if you want to sign up and come to the second part of this one as well. And if you can't come to the second part, it also will be recorded. Yes, we will definitely record both this. And recording record the this same recording. recording. Yep. Yep. Uh, okay, well, I don't see any additional questions. So with that, uh, I'd like to say thank you, everybody, again, and we do look forward to seeing you in the future. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.